Hello again, this is Keith Parsons with Heavy Wireless, part of the Packet Pushers Podcast Network. And today I have Tom Hollingsworth with me, and we're going to be talking about the experience paradox. Tom had uh, mentioned something like this in a blog post he did, and I went, oh, I got to have Tom on the show. Tom, how are you doing? I'm great, Keith. Thanks for having me. So what was your impetus for writing this experience blog you wrote? Well, it was a quote from a recent networking field day event that uh, one of the presenters said, uh, there's no compression algorithm for experience. And you know how you get like that Eureka light bulb moment. And I thought about it. I said, you know, he's exactly right. And the problem that we face today is that too many people are trying to do that. Like for, uh, if you've ever done project management, you've, you've heard the term crashing the project, right? It's like we've laid out how quickly everything is going to need to be in order to hap- make this happen. And what's the first thing we need to do? Well, where can we crunch this down? Where can we crash things together? Uh, by the way, my favorite example of why we don't crash projects is the Martian uh, because when you start trying to cut off the things, you start trying to speed things up. What you end up doing is blowing up rockets and not saving Matt Damon. Very good example. For those of you who haven't read the book, I, I like the book better than the movie because it, mm. it had more engineering in it. But The Martian's a, a great example of that. Yeah. Well, I was just uh, the the real thing about this quote is it kind of puts into perspective for me where we're at as an industry right now, because we have a lot of people who have experience and they have jobs and they're kind of comfortable where they're at. And we're not going to work forever. Uh, I mean, hopefully we're not going to work forever, but we have a group of people that are coming up that need to learn those same skills. Maybe they don't need to learn the exact same skills that we do because I'm still pretty well versed in windows 3.1. And I, unless you work for Southwest airlines, you won't need to know how to use that. But where do they learn these things? Because I'm actually one of the the few people when I went to college that had to take a class on Microsoft Word and Excel to learn how to use them. Literally the next semester when I was in college, they just assumed that you knew all of those things because you had worked on Microsoft um, software your entire life. And so rather than having you take an entire class, which was a very easy A, by the way, They just said, when you come in, you need to take this proficiency exam to prove that you know it. And if not, you have to take a zero credit hour course to get basically remedial learning in how to manipulate a widget table in Excel or something. And I think it's interesting how the industry tends to shift to this whole idea behind this is a new technology and you need to know how to use it versus, oh, everybody knows how to use this and I shouldn't even need to ask you anymore. And that leaves a bit of a gap if you're not someone who's exposed to those kinds of things. But yet when you look down the laundry list of things that are on a job rack, it's like, oh, you must know all of these things or we won't even consider you for the position. Well, I think part of that is the disconnect between the hiring manager who needs the worker and someone in HR who doesn't want to go through a thousand CVs. So the more we put in, then the fewer CVs we get, and then it makes the decision easier. And of course, you would want someone with all the experience and all the certifications and all the education possible, but many times it's for a junior position. It is, and that is one of the biggest problems, and it's one of the things that I I kind of wrote about when I was noodling through this idea, is there are positions out there that when you read down the laundry list of things that they're supposed to know – you would think that this is a position that's you know mid to upper tier in the organization. And then you look down and it's like, oh, well, this is a junior level position with junior level pay. And so it, it, it frustrates me when I see that, because do you want the perfect employee and you only want to pay them a junior ranking? Or do you really want someone to come in that will work for that money and you have to accept the fact that maybe you're going to have to teach them how to use some of this stuff? Because I... We don't have trade schools in IT. Yes, we have some education programs, whether they're networking academies or, you know, uh, online courses or things like that. But that's not on the job training. I mean, just go ask anyone in the industry the horror stories of newly minted certified individuals who go in and do something that isn't going to work in production that worked in their lab. Uh, My favorite one is like the debug IP packet detail command on whatever unit you're using. We'll grind that thing to a halt. It's not bad if you're doing it on a, you know, a, a campus lab switch. But if you do it on a core switch in an ISP, uh, well, that's how news gets made. But yet these people always did it that way. And then reality is different than practice. 
Well, we can even back up a little further. Uh, I don't know your first job. Um, my first job was being a lifeguard, and then I moved, and the next place did, it was in the winter, and there was no lifeguarding job. So I thought I wanted to be a busboy because they got paid, and it was the only job that I was qualified for. And I applied for like four of them, and all of them said, you have no experience. And I remember the frustration thinking, how do I get experience as a busboy if I'm not a busboy? And, and that's a, that's a obviously stupidly experiment because it's like one hour of experience is all you really needed to to know how to do that. How do you get experience when you're fresh out of school or or just got certified, but you need experience and everyone asks for it? Thus, thus I call this the experience paradox. You need experience to get experience, and how do you get around that? And that is so hard in the industry today because you're talking about something that's essentially like a generalist type of thing. How do I get experience being a waiter or being a sales clerk? Uh, that's, you know, their, their answer to that. How do I get experience being like a nuclear power plant technician? How do I get experience being a, uh, you know, a, a certain kind of database administrator? Well, there's only one way to do it is you have to actually do the thing, Right. Well, the question then becomes, do I do the thing practicing it somewhere or do I do the thing in production knowing that I might make mistakes? And it kind of goes hand in hand with, is the organization willing to let you figure out how to do these things along the way? Any organization out there would love to have you do the thing the way they need it to be done. That is like an unwritten rule, because here's another thing, and I've, I've dealt with this all the time in my career, and I'm sure you have too, Keith. I may have knowledge in the way that something is done on your job rec, but when I come in, it's not going to be done the exact way that you want it done. We deploy the machine this way. We configure the software this way. Well, that's not the way that best practice says to do it. Well, I know, but that's the way that we do it. So you don't actually want someone who has a lot of experience in this area. You want someone with just enough experience to understand how to do things your way which means they need to do things in your company, your way. And so that is where it really kind of gets into that whole challenge of where are they going to get that experience? Because they can only get it working for your company. Well, and it has, has kind of two parts. One is you have to trust them enough to fail. And you've met enough people who work in networking with your days with, with tech field days. Have you ever met anyone who hasn't made a big boo-boo? The, anytime anybody asks this question on social media, what's the biggest mistake that you've ever made in networking, wireless storage, whatever? And you're going to get some big ones, whether it's erasing mailboxes or crashing networks or taking down phone systems. But that is one of the best experience teachers out there is, oops, don't do that again. Uh, you know, it's, we, we always liken it back to something like with children. It's like, don't touch the hot stove. Well, what do they usually do? They go and touch the hot stove. Then they know, don't do that again, right? It's, we, we, there are so many things. Like I remember back at, when I wasn't working for Field Day, when I was doing a, a senior engineer role, I would actually, when I would see a problem that I immediately recognized, I would have junior people working with me and I would have them diagnose the problem with guidance to say, now you know what that looks like. So if you ever see it again, you know immediately how to fix it as opposed to like, messing around for hours trying to solve it because that's what happened to me on my third day on the job. I had to solve a bridging loop. I didn't know what this was. I didn't know anything about networking. And so anytime I ever saw one of those, I'm like, Oh, Hey, I know exactly what's happening, but walk me through how you would figure this out. And so they, they see the results and gain that knowledge that you can only gain by being in that moment. Like I can tell you theoretically what that looks like, but until you've experienced it in reality, you won't know what to look for. I think that's the the dichotomy between education, certification, and experience. People who have experience, hopefully, are the ones writing the courses and the exams. And then the education component is supposed to bring you up to speed and make sure you don't make those stupid mistakes. And so you practice them, but in a lab environment you still have to make some big boo-boos. I don't know anyone who hasn't. So, so people are afraid it's going to happen. And yeah, cloud strikes probably a pretty big one, but hopefully they're smaller. And I think that's where we have also an issue with, with the employers and the employees. Employees want to pretend they have the experience, but never have made a mistake. 
employers want you to never make a mistake on a production network. And yet you don't move forward without mistakes. That's, that's kind of just what happens. Yeah. In a vacuum, everything works perfectly every time. We also like to refer to that as PowerPoint. Nobody ever, code always <laughs> works in PowerPoint. But in reality, there's always a mistake somewhere. There's a bug somewhere. There's a thing that needs to be fixed. And some of it comes down to, and I'm going to, I'm going to share an unpopular opinion with a lot of people. Some of it comes down to the fact that people just don't know what they're doing and that's okay. Like, you know, you have to be willing to step back sometimes and go, I think I know how to fix this, but I don't know for sure. And I do this a lot when I teach youth, because the first thing that happens with most of the, the youth is they'll do something and then they'll get it right. And then that's it. That's the the end of, of their learning, right? I did this right once. So what I'm often telling them is, I don't want you to practice this until you get it right. I want you to practice it until there's no way you can get it wrong. So I want you to go through every possible wrong way to do this or, you know, do it upside down, underwater, in the dark, whatever, so that when the time comes for you to do this, it's a it's a an innate thing. It's a learned skill that you cannot get wrong. It's like learning a language, right? I can sit here and I can do Duolingo all day long. But if I'm not around people speaking that language, it will never become ingrained into my brain enough for me to be able to switch on command. I'll always be thinking about grammar rules and words for things. And and is my accent correct? Will they be able to understand me? Whereas, you know, let's just use Spanish as an example. If I moved to Mexico City for six months, I promise you my Spanish would improve instantly because I wouldn't have an option not to use it. Those are all true statements. But I would like to go, between the two of us, we have decades of experience. If someone's listening to this, how do you, how you go about getting that experience? So in your in your language, it's it's move to move to Mexico. When I was in my yeah, nineteen, I moved to China to and I learned to speak Chinese because you, you're right, you don't have any choice. Sometimes you have to make some pretty tough decisions to go and try things. Yes, that is that is number one. Nobody is ever going to get better being comfortable, and and this is where we run into so many problems. Is people want to learn right? But they don't want to stretch those boundaries. The number of times in my career that I've heard people say, well, I'm only going to study when I'm on the clock because I don't want, uh, I don't want to do this without getting paid. Well, you are paying, you're investing in your future. And if you're not willing to make yourself uncomfortable to grab a book and read it in your off hours, you're never going to get better. So you have to start building that knowledge base because no amount of beginner's luck is going to get you through a complicated task. You have to have at the very minimum, an amount of knowledge that says, I know how these systems operate. I know how this works. Then you have to be willing to put yourself out there to tell somebody you want to gain experience in this. So whether it's, you know, you're working in an organization and you're on the network team, and suddenly you want to learn more about wireless. Okay, well, I've gone and I've, I've read the CWNA book, so I understand a lot of the basics of wireless. Now I want to actually touch a thing. Maybe maybe I'm not uh, permitted to, to configure it, but maybe I want to look at it, see what, what the theory translates to in reality. You've got to be willing to, to stretch your knowledge base to get that experience. And maybe you'll find out it's not for you. But maybe you will find out that it's easier than you're thinking. And by showing that you're picking up these skills, not only have you made yourself more valuable, but the people on your team will see that and they'll be willing to give you more experience. Again, going back to my previous role where I was mentoring people, I would grab folks and be like, OK, this looks like something you might be interested in. Let's go see how it works. I want to show you how this thing operates. And sometimes people will be like, hey, thank you for that, but not my not my wheelhouse. I, I want to move on. I'm like, OK, that's fine. But you, if you don't, if you're not willing to work with people, if you're not willing to expand your skill set, then you're never going to get better. I harken back to the first time I took a CCNA course. My instructor was Todd Lamley. He was teaching it. And like how you talk to your youth, I had just completed the first lab on the first router I'd ever touched and I worked perfectly the first time and and he says type this command and I erased 
the command erased my entire config. I was quite upset at the moment, like, how dare you? I, it's just working perfectly. And he comes back, he goes, okay, do it again then. But, but I got it right. So I think one of the things that, that's helpful to get that experience, but not, is to have a home lab that's yours. It's not the lab at the office. Again, you're not getting paid to work on a lab. Some people love that they have that, but I've, I've never met people who have, <laughs> have that kind of that experience where they don't have to have their own home lab. But in your home lab, don't stop when you get it to work. Break it. And through your CCIE labs, it, it's all about the, fixing the broken, not about making it work right the first time. That's the easy part. So in if you have a lab, when you get it working, the first step is to break it and say, I can do it again. Uh, your example of, I don't know, lighting a fire with Boy Scouts, kind of hard to do it on underwater but upside down yeah in the dark yeah i mean so find situations that you think you're comfortable with your lab if you're comfortable you're not learning anything yeah, don't, so, exactly don't right. so keep breaking it. or better have someone else break it um did you think your your cci lab experience taught you more than being with customers and on yeah. real equipment so it taught me a lot about the way that they wanted the test to work, but I learned more being out in person. I learned things that worked one way that didn't work another way that you'd never do in, in a lab environment. You know, like, yeah, you know, how many times have you written down a lesson and then in the margins of the book are notes? Never do it like this. Here's another way to, to make that happen. Or use this thing that's not anywhere listed anywhere in the curriculum to make this job a whole lot easier. Um, they... There's there's the ideal world of of education, right, where I built this construct to show you a specific way that something happens. How many times have you ever opened up a book or a lab exercise? And the very first thing you think is I would never build it this way. Most people will say that right at one point, like, I don't even understand why you would do something this dumb. Well, it's because I'm trying to show you something very specific. So all of those, for, for anyone out there who's studying for some kind of a, a practical lab exam, anytime there is a question and at the bottom of it says, don't use the following term or command, they are looking for a very specific result. They want to see if you've studied B instead of A or C instead of B, because they need to know how you're going to implement that, or better yet, especially on the CCIE lab, whether or not you realize that choosing between B and C actually affects something you're going to do in four hours. But you wouldn't know that unless you, um, you understand the way. My favorite question about this, and I'm, I'm not giving anything away here, is uh, on a Cisco router, when you number access lists, they're numbered in tens, like in basic. Well, um, there are certain questions that will ask you to insert a statement into a lab, uh, into an access list, and number it 15. You have to know as soon as you do that, that if you reboot that router for any reason, it renumbers all of those statements. And so the 15 goes away. So you lose all the points on that question. You wouldn't know that unless you've programmed enough access list and rebooted enough routers to know, oh, wait a minute. That is what happens. Those are the examples of experience that you can't get by reading a sentence in a book. Like it's sometimes it is just a weird kind of. The, sometimes it's the catch 22 situation, right? It's like, I have to do this thing, but I don't know how to do this thing, but I won't know how to do the thing until I do the thing. And so you're, you're kind of stuck with how you want to accomplish it. And, and people get hung up on that too much. It's just, you know, the best time to do this is now start, do the book, uh, get the lab, practice a thing. Um, you know, half of the CCIE is typing. It's like learning how to type quickly enough to get the commands into the device to do that. And typing, if any if anybody out there who's gone, no, nobody's born a touch typist. Typing only gets better the more you do it. It's a muscle memory thing. If you want an example of this, the best example that I've ever seen is in the Karate Kid movie. When, you know, Daniel's son has Wash been waxing cars yeah. and painting fences. And he's like, I hate this. You You didn't teach me anything. And then Miyagi is like, watch. And so he shows that the muscle memory of waxing cars and painting fences is actually training your body to respond to other things. And it that I have that scene book 
bookmarked on YouTube because I, I use it all the time as an example of sometimes you don't realize the things you're doing are building your skills until you're put in a situation where you need to have those skills. Well, let's talk about r recommendations between the two of us for two groups of people. One, what can employers do to to put in their their hiring recs to be kinder and more accurate? And the second is what can employees do to answer those recs as honestly as possible? So I'll start with the second one first, at least in my my experience, is you have to tell the people what they're looking for, right? You if if the rec says that you need to have this certification and you need to have experience in this area. You need to be able to answer those questions. It's like the old joke, right? Of, are you a doctor? Well, I stayed at a holiday Inn express last night. You're not answering the question. Whereas if you said, are you a doctor? Well, no, but I've been trained as an EMT. Okay. Well, I know that there's an equivalence of those skills to the point where maybe what I'm trying to accomplish, I'm not trying to like do a, you know, a tracheotomy in, in a hotel, uh, room. I'm just trying to figure out if you can like, you know, fix my broken finger or something. And so you have to be able to equate your skill set to what they're looking for. And yeah, I know it's a laundry list of stuff most of the time. But and this is a little dirty secret for you employer employee people out there that are applying. They're not actually looking for all of those skills. That is their their wish list, right? I, I want a pony and I want a car and I want a house in the Hamptons. You're not going to get all of those things. But if you get one of those things, that's nice. So you need to figure out through reading through the job rec, like if the if the skill or I'm sorry, if the job that they're looking for is senior network engineer and they list off a whole bunch of programming stuff. Are they really looking for someone who can program or are they looking for someone who has networking knowledge? So tailor your response to what you think that skill set's going to be. Because I'll tell you, if you get rejected because you tailored your skill set and they're like, well, you didn't include these things, so that's wrong. They don't actually know what they're looking for. Well, and that leads to the first was what can employers do to to define better what they're looking for? Stop putting the kitchen sink in your job recs. I mean, it, <laughs> it, it, it sounds comically silly, but... Do not go out and list off every little thing that you want to see in this job rec, because what you're going to get is either no resumes or you're going to get a ton of resumes that say those things. And then when you bring them back in for the job interview, they're going to go, well, I don't actually know that. I just put it on there because you put it in the thing. Like how many times have we seen companies do that? Like they'll sneak something into a job rec. It's like, oh, you need to have five years of experience in this programming language. It's only been here for two years. Well, why did I put it there? Well, it's because I'm trying to catch people who are lying to me and I'm just going to toss those resumes. Sometimes the hiring people just don't quite understand it. But, you know, there's always that disconnect, right? You've got the person who has the job role and then they have to hand that off to HR. Well, now you've created the telephone game. Hiring to HR, to the job rec, to the person. And then the person could be the best fit if they would just talk to the person who's hiring for the job. But in a world where there's jobs available and like hundreds of people that want to apply for them, that's tough. But here's the other thing employers need to realize. And it kind of goes back to what I said earlier. You're never going to find the perfect candidate for the job at your company. You have to be willing to invest in people too. And maybe that means that, okay, you have two years of experience on this database. And I asked for four. Is two good enough? Because one may not be enough. And eight may be too many because we can't afford somebody who has eight years on that. But is two enough? Can I train somebody of those extra two years, especially if they have a good grounding in the basics, right? Because, like, if, if the difference is it's a basic level with just our little quirkiness about how to do stuff, that's a trainable thing, right? You can have that person up and running in a few weeks. But they just they don't want to do that. They don't want to invest in employees and, and ask anybody out there. Oh, exp employees are so expensive because they have to have benefits and vacation time and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, they're not robots, but they're also not able to completely ingest Wikipedia at like an LLM would and spit out knowledge. You have to be willing to train them the way you want the job done. And that's true of anything, whether it's an IT job or a sales job, because I promise you, if you've ever been in a situation where a salesperson is a bad fit for um, the role that they're in, they may be great at selling stuff, but they're not great at selling this stuff. One of the things I like is the term SE, the sales engineer, 
And I, I've had people say, yeah, we, yes, we're looking for an SE, but it needs to be like 90% S. So what you're really looking for is an AM. You're ne- you need an yeah. account manager who knows just enough about the product to be able to talk to somebody who knows about the product. But they and, and also need to be able to answer any technical question. I get that. There are so many things out there. And, and part of it is the title problem, right? Like how many times have you ever encountered somebody who has a grandiose title and you realize that there's no point for that? One of my favorites is at an old job, um, somebody was the head of the sales department. Their official title was director of business development. Well, what are you doing? I am teaching the salespeople how to sell. Well, then why doesn't your title have sales in it? Well, because director of business development sounds more important than than sales manager. I'm like, so now we're we're trying to trick people and they hated it from that point forward because yeah like i well or you know you're the vice president of a department with no employees and then what are you the vice president of you are the only employee in the department you might as well say you're the ceo right it comes down to hr hr just has this hierarchy thing that they believe in we can't pay you this unless you're a vp and but we need you here and you need the money so we'll call you a vp and you have no one reporting to you or as soon as you say, like, you're the C something, oh, oh, well, that's a different pay schedule and you have these different fiduciary responsibilities. So we can't actually do that. So we're going to create this role like, you know, senior contributor or something like that. So you're going to get paid like those people, but you don't have that other responsibility and we don't have that liability. That's how it goes. Well, Tom, I I think this has been educational. Hopefully people have learned a little bit how how to get past that that experience paradox, both from an employee and employer side. Uh, I want to take a chance and tell us a little bit about Tech Field Day and Gestalt IT. Sure. Um, my day job what, that I got hired for, uh, with no experience, by the way, is to uh, talk to companies about the things that they're doing and invite people like Keith and others to kind of sit in the audience and offer their experience and their their conversational skills to kind of get to where things are with it, right? The way that I've always described it here as of late is, what if your webinars didn't suck? And so that's what we do at Tech Field Day. And then the media arm of that is Gestalt IT, where we kind of write up what we hear about that and what we see about that. We we do podcasts and a lot of other things, but you know, it's all part of a, a bigger organization, the Futurum Group, where we're trying to bring that experience of the practitioner into a you know a, a grander uh, scale of you know financial analysis and and traditional um, uh, analytics and things like that. Um, we represent the voice of the people who are the trusted advisors of those in the stakeholder suite that are going to be asking the right questions anyway. And so, you know, techfieldday.com is a great place to learn more about the event. Gestaltit.com is a great place to go to learn more about the media side of things. And then, of course, the Futurum Group, uh, futurumgroup.com is where you can go to learn about all the other things that we do there. But the goal ultimately is to make practitioners better, to make them more knowledgeable, to get them the, the learning and set them on the road to experience so that they can hopefully change the world one day. Um, where can people track you down personally? And, and wh- where's your blog? Well, if you want to see my Batman job, what I do after I, I log off for the day, uh, my blog is networkingnerd.net. Um, I, I don't write there as much as I used to, but uh, I'm still putting out content, kind of like the uh, the uh, impression algorithm for experience blog post. Um, but you can find me most social media. I'm at Networking Nerd. Um, and if you have a response to this, if you think that I, I'm wrong, uh, I would love to talk about it. Uh, you can just hit me up, leave me a comment, um, you know, track me down somehow. I, I'm pretty out there and I'm not a to uh, discuss it with you. Well, thank you very much. You've been listening to another episode of Heavy Wireless, part of the Packet Pushers Podcast Network. We look forward to talking to you in the future.